I'm the dude. So that's what you call me. Are you a virgin? Yeah, yeah not, not since I was 10. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Come to the coast. We get together. Have a few laughs. Hey, gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. Can I return it if it doesn't fit? It always fits. Eventually. Hey, welcome back, movie minglers. This is Caveman and Maggie. Hi, everybody. And we are on our sixth episode. Already. Which is going to be Joker. Yay. So real quick, Joker came out in 2019, directed by Todd Phillips, produced by Village Roadshow, a joint project, uh, obviously the main distributor was Warner Brothers being a DC project. We'll get more into that. It won 121 awards. It was nominated for 11 Oscars and awarded two of them, which were for Best Lead Actor by Joaquin Phoenix and Original Score. You had never seen this movie before. I had never seen this movie before. I saw it way back when it came out about what did you think of joker this movie got under my skin in a way that i wasn't emotionally prepared for um i did not want to like this movie i didn't want to like it i didn't want to like it for so many reasons i'm not a big fan of joaquin phoenix i think he's pretentious and kind of a douche i don't like the fan base of this film you know all those sort of right-wing men out there taking the wrong message out of this movie and the, the discourse that came out before, during, and after this film. I didn't like any of that. I don't think the Joker needs a backstory at all because he's a perfect agent of chaos just in being the Joker and we don't need to feel sympathy for him. So I went into this movie fully expecting to hate it and I didn't. And I hate that. I hate that I liked it. I thought that this was an incredibly well-made movie and I'm so pissed off about that. I have all I have so many good feelings about this film and I have so many bad feelings about this film. But most importantly, I have so much like visceral crawling out of my skin ugh, like reaction to this film that I need to get it out before I go insane. That's kind of why I have only seen this movie once before you and I watched it together. Mm -hmm. It's I, not a movie that I think bears repeat viewing. I Yeah, I really didn't want to see it again, and I never thought I would, but we're doing this podcast. Here we and are. It's on the list, so Hoodly. we did the Joker again. Of course, if during this episode you hear any random bangs, pops, or crashes in the background, that is just producer Robin fulfilling his producer duties of being an absolute terror. He's a, not only is he a producer but now i think he got hired on as a foley artist oh, he's <laughs> yeah any sound effects in the background uh can be credited to producer foley robin who is uh he's a little tuxedo cat and if you guys have a tuxedo cat or have ever had one you know he's not even a year old either so he's an absolute monster and we just have to put up with him because he's cute and he's our son's cat <laughs> When the movie started, we get Arthur out waving a sign around. Who would hire a clown to be a sign waver? There are clown sign wavers. I know, and if I were to see a clown sign waver, I would not go into that store because I have immediate distaste of clowns. I do have a fear of clowns. Yes, the caveman is pretty afraid of clowns. I just don't like them. Although uh, there is some clown heritage in my kind of extended family. We do know somebody who is a professional clown for his whole life and is in the Clown Hall of Fame. It's a different sort of clown. He's it's more definitely of definitely not this kind of clown. Yeah, he's more of like a fun hillbilly like circus clown versus fucking the Joker. Um. Yeah. Uh, so he's waving his sign around. And the reason I'm bringing up this scene is mainly because... The sign is stolen from him. He's taken. He chases some some hooligans, some who kids, youths. the youths, who who are the the cause of all the problems in the world, <laughs> who break his sign over his face. Yeah, and then start beating him just because he's a clown. Um, honestly, I wish that I was one of those kids kicking the shit out of him. That that would have been cathartic for me for so many reasons. But I just it was like the essentially the opening shot of the movie and you immediately well while we were watching it you immediately just started like 
Ugh, why, why does he even care about this stupid sign what anyway? Why does he even care about the sign? Like, the sign comes up later on. He gets yelled at at, for, at his... It's going to come gets, out of his pay. He gets yelled at by his boss because he doesn't return the sign. And he doesn't manage to explain, this sign was broken over my face. He didn't take the sign and the shards Too bad. back to the... Signs are really expensive. The signs are really fucking expensive, I guess. They're more expensive than Joaquin Phoenix's face. Watching. But I just remember... You're... you're, you're immediate just like ugh, this movie already i didn't want to like it man like you you know me we've talked about this before caveman i didn't want to fucking like this film and i'm so pissed off that i do and i don't i have a lot of emotions about this one well let's just start talking about them like i still don't really like this movie but for me it's still because they were disguising it as a DC movie. The Joker doesn't need a background. Not only does he not need a background story, because we all know that the Joker is better when he's mysterious. Yeah. And you don't know his... You don't know why he got these scars. Exactly. And you don't need to know why he got these scars. Like, the fact that that story changes... I can't wait to watch The Dark Knight again and talk about it on this podcast. I can't wait to watch The Batman again and talk about this podcast. What some of you may know is that Caveman and I are just diehard, massive Batman fans. We've had so many deep, intellectual conversations, arguments, times of laughter, times of tears about Batman. We fucking love Batman. Batman the Animated Series was super important to both of us growing up, independently of each other. We have never missed a Batman movie in theater together. We, I mean, even the bad ones, even the Zack Snyder Batfleck ones like we went to see because it's fucking batman we love batman and in doing so we love batman's rogue gallery and the joker is batman's best adversary and the joker does not need a backstory he is better when he's just an anonymous psycho who is out there just being evil and killing and and being merciless he shouldn't be the guy who killed bruce wayne's parents he shouldn't be you know, some sad sack with mental illness who gets fucked over again and again and again by the system and the rich and everything in the world until he becomes the Joker. He is just pure evil. We don't need to give crazy white men a backstory and sympathy as to why they are crazy and evil. Like, just let them be crazy and evil. But even still, I felt for Arthur Fleck and I don't want to. Like... This poor guy. This poor fucking guy. Like, no wonder he went insane. This could have been an incredible film about one man's journey from mental illness into a criminal life because of how the system is set up against everybody who is downtrodden in that way. But they didn't need to package the Joker to it. Don't give me a Joker backstory. The Joker is just evil. I know that one bad day can cause anybody to completely ruin their lives the joker is just evil and i don't want to be sad about him so i'm not going to be the only one to point this out but i wanted to bring it up this movie seems like it's just a remake of other movies like it that came before it like how like a you know that poor guy down in his luck that you know it takes one bad day oh yeah no it's 100 percent falling down you got you falling remember. down yeah. you got taxi driver um, i mean those were the big influences on this film it was also compared a lot to keegan comedy which i haven't seen i haven't seen either that or taxi driver and i haven't seen falling down in years so for people who don't know falling down was about an ordinary man he starts to see the flaws in society and violently starts to lash out at the public and essentially other criminals mostly other criminals in that movie um, and then taxi driver is about a mentally unstable veteran works as a nighttime taxi driver in new york city per- he he sees the perceived decadence and sleaziness of the city and it urges violent actions out of him and then there's king of comedy which is about a passionate unsuccessful comedian who stalks and kidnaps his idol and uh, so that he can take the spotlight for himself, which is also directed by Martin Scorsese and also stars Robert De Niro. So yes, these kind of films have been done before, and I'm just... 
Yeah, so but now, every film has been done before. I mean, Dune I know, Star so Wars. I know, so what was the know. point of making this one? Because this one is the Joker. Oh. This one is... It's it's a mythology that we all know. I mean, the Batman and the Joker have been ingrained in our society since, I mean, well, since the sixties easily. I think feel like it's probably when when Batman, Batman and the Joker have been around for ages. I mean, for as long as the Joker has been a character, and Batman has needed that sort of foil, you know, they have been around. And so, yeah, it. I guess I understand the reasoning behind wanting to show his backstory and give him his taxi driver moment um because all movies are just all you know versions of all other movies and stories like that's all retold and that's okay i mean barbie was pinocchio and spirited away was alice in wonderland and i mean all yeah, of but these those films. movies weren't on the like so on the nose yeah i mean I read that Todd Phillips was inspired by these films when he was writing. First, we've got Joker. And I just say that because the title card just filled the entire screen of just Joker. The man needs therapy more than anything. I mean, it's very clear. He even has a therapist or a counselor that he sees once a week to try to get his medicine from and to talk to but like this guy fuck this guy needs help and in 19 early 1980s gotham there was no help there was no help for people like this um you know the the city is in a crime wave it's the fall everybody's pissed off uh they're giant rats which supposedly if you pay close enough attention to the movie you can see some of the giant rats in the background which is something i read on imdb shout out to what our a favorite. weird thing what a weird thing right yeah like so gotham is uh it's, well, it's a powder keg ready to explode you say gotham but it's new I don't, york i don't think they say the word gotham even once they do i i was paying quite a bit i I, I never remember heard, them calling them Gotham. I remember a them of times. saying, I remember them saying the city, mm-hmm. and I remember them saying Arkham State Hospital, but never, I didn't ever hear one Gotham. Which is Arkham the state that Gotham is in, or is Arkham the county? Like, what is Arkham? Arkham is a man's last name. Okay. And he named the asylum after. So they just turned it in, instead of a Arkham Asylum, they turned it into Arkham State Hospital. Yeah. To make it more modern or fit into the story yeah, whatever. less comic booky they like definitely this whole movie. they definitely i i remember hearing gotham said a couple of times but it's quick it's not like it's in your face the way that say other batman movies are clearly set in gotham even though it's chicago or you know st louis or wherever else they decided to film this is a very like down and dirty like 80s new york that also happens to be gotham city uh, and it's not a great place. I mean, Arthur lives in a shitty apartment with his ailing mom. There's a trash strike, so trash is piling up everywhere. There's a ton of crime, as evident by the fact that he got the shit kicked out of him at the very beginning of the film by a bunch of fucking teenage hooligans. You know, it's it's not a good place to be, and in the background of all of this is the story that Thomas Wayne, billionaire Thomas Wayne, wants to run for mayor and save the city, but if you've ever watched a Batman movie, you know how that goes down and yeah but like it's it's a lot of people you can kind of feel the sense of hopelessness and anger that is in the city in this film which i thought was an excellent use of just like background exposition and set dressing i thought they they did a really good job showing the sort of like squalor of gotham city that arthur lives in and what he eventually becomes fed up with i did enjoy that um, we meet his mom, who is ill. She's old. She's sick. She's maybe a little mentally off. Um, maybe a little senile. Yeah, very frail. And Arthur takes loving care of her. He's a very dutiful son and takes good care of he her. He does. We also meet around the same time Murray, basically the Jay Leno, or like the Letterman of Gotham. He's the late night talk show host that everybody tunes in and watches played by Robert De Niro doing his best Tony Bennett impersonation. Yeah. For, <laughs> for a show that was like very look Johnny Carson looking. Yeah. But his character yeah. didn't fit the set. 
looked very well to me. He like, just looked like Tony Bennett. The whole time I was like, why, when are we going to get Robert De Niro to be in Tony Bennett in a film? Let's make that happen, Lady Gaga. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned the mom and how she believes, or she used to, she says she used to work for Thomas Wayne. Mm-hmm. And I'm not the biggest fan of the Thomas Wayne character in this movie. Oh, he's an absolute douchebag. He's a huge asshole. And I don't believe Thomas Wayne would ever run for, I don't think he would run for any political position. Well, I mean, this isn't the first movie either to have, all the, no, it isn't the first movie to have. Thomas Wayne have political aspirations. I mean, that is something that it happens in the Batman, if you remember, uh, that Thomas Wayne was also trying to run for mayor. I'm pretty sure it's established in the comics that Thomas Wayne was trying to run for mayor. I think that they were trying to give him more of a, like a Bobby Kennedy esque. I don't vibe. like him as a politician. I like no. him as my favorite version of Thomas Wayne was in Batman Begins, where he's. A doctor, a, a doctor kind, who's, who's super hot. Yeah, and he wants the best for the city. I can help you uh, solve all these problems. Just vote for me. Yeah. I'm like, really? That's yeah, but he it? wasn't going to solve any of those problems. So he wasn't my favorite. Even though I, I do like the actor uh, played by Brett Cullen, who played a congressman in The Dark Knight Rises. He was supposed to be played by Alec Baldwin. Originally, they had said that Alec Baldwin was going to be Thomas Wayne, um, but he had to pull out due to... Wow. Of, you know, scheduling difficulties and whatnot. But I think that Alec Baldwin would have added a certain amount of smarmy, he would have douchey really... charm to which, the role. Which, I mean, uh, Brett Cullen, I think, did a pretty good job playing on that douche. But uh, I Alec think Baldwin Alec Baldwin would have, would have yeah, he would really have been, it out of the it would have been one. interesting to see yeah. his portrayal as Thomas Wayne. Because, I mean, if you've seen him as Jack Donaghy, you've kind of seen him as Thomas Wayne. But... Still, it it would have been a fun, it would have been an interesting thing to see him go up against uh, Joaquin Phoenix, too. I do feel like they they were really trying to shoehorn a lot of Batman into this movie. Yeah. Where they didn't need to, but it was, I feel like it was called The Joker to get butts in the seats. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, you know, Todd Phillips wanted to make a Martin Scorsese film, but the only way people would come and watch it. The only way he was allowed to make it. The only way he could DC tag on the label. He had had to to put a DC label on the box. This is essentially fan fiction. I mean, it It, is using an established IP, an established world and character and creating your own story around it. And so, yeah, this is big screen fan fiction that won Oscars. Not saying, and, and I'm not putting that down. I'm not putting fan fiction down. Lord knows there is fan fiction out on the internet that I've written about the mummy that I will never own to. This, that's what this movie is. It is essentially kind of a big version of a fanfic. And if Thomas Wayne was the only other DC character in this whole movie, I think I would have liked it a little bit more. Oh, yeah. But the fact that they had to shoe in Martha Wayne and Bruce, Bruce. Wayne. And they also... Alfred, who was the worst Alfred I have ever seen on they, film? They also had to put in things like, well, he has to laugh a lot because he's the Joker. How are we going to get him a laugh? Oh, let's make it a mental illness so that he just constantly... Is... That is actually a real mental illness, of course, which no, we're but it, not it, mocking. But, but for the Joker, like they yeah. had to find a, a, way, a way to... Get him to get cackle him to... and so, be a Well, he's got laugh. this illness. Yeah. Again, trying to make us feel sympathy for a character that nobody should ever feel sympathy for. Like, you should never be rooting for the Joker. It is hard to make the villain the main character because at a certain point, are you sympathetic with him because of who he is, because of what he is, because of how he is? Like, how does any of that kind of play out? If you think about it, like, we're supposed to feel for this guy and you do feel for him because his life is shit and everything is hard for him you understand why he has this you know this brain injury that caused him to laugh all the time because he was abused as a child i didn't need to know that information why does that have to be a part of his backstory just to make us feel bad for him why do we need to feel bad for him he's the bad guy yeah the director is forcing us to sympathize with the villain and it's awkward but It doesn't take away from the fact that this movie is incredibly well done. I mean, we can argue, basically our whole argument is why did this have to be the Joker? And we could talk literally for hours about this, but I think what we really need to do is just kind of talk about what the movie is. 
as opposed to what well i'm just trying to get across why i didn't like it yeah and part of that is them it'd be one thing if todd phillips just decided to do a movie on the psychological uh break of a man man. of a yeah a man a clown a a stand-up comedian Mm -hmm. do something better for his mom and his life and dreamed of it you know him dreaming of um murray taking him in as his own son yeah like having that fantasy like his fantasies are so cringe it has the the to me it has the building blocks of being a really good film but why why the joker why like well because if it wasn't the joker is it just the cash grab is it just because nobody would see it if it wasn't todd phillips is a known director maybe he really wanted to create this story about a character that he loved but so basically what you're trying to say is if you stripped away all of the batman like lore from this film would it have been as good i think it would have been better i think it would have been better too i i wholeheartedly agree that if this film wasn't saddled with the idea that it had to be i mean a batman movie one of the one of the worst parts of the movies for myself well there's two parts there's yeah. a music cue for one part and Ugh. then there's a shot literally of thomas and martha wayne being killed in the alley I... and once again fucking pearls with the pearls gotta go flying Jesus i remember Christ. i remember when Zack snyder's what was Zack snyder's for, oh uh bvs yeah, batman, batman versus superman, superman. i remember right before that movie came out you know we all know Zack snyder loves using slow motion Mm -hmm. and he really gets carried away with it sometimes Mm -hmm. and i remember we i was listening to another podcast and um matt myra had mentioned had said on that podcast if i if we see slow motion pearls drop into the ground drop off the ground in Zack snyder form he's like i've I've had it with the like if there's one more film doing this and that was back in bvs days yeah and now here we go another like 2019 pearls another fall into the ground it's like i'm that's... so tired of watching batman or you know bruce wayne's parents get killed like we've seen it we've, we've seen, seen it, it time and time and time again and everybody talks about how like in the mcu they don't show spider-man's yeah. uh, ultimate creation Tom like Holland you, spider-man doesn't you don't see the spider bite him you don't hear the well you do hear the great power great responsibility line but you don't see uncle ben die it's not uncle ben, yeah it, it's it's a whole thing that they just decided to cut out because we fucking know it we, we know, know it. it we've seen it i and i feel like that was another shoehorn like we're just gonna oh like, yeah hey we're, we're folk we've been doing this whole movie about the joker yeah but so we're now we gotta remind you... you that it's a joker film again, yeah that it's a batman movie here's batman in an alley or his parents in an alley and this movie killed. should have killed bruce wayne this movie should have killed Bruce Wayne. I think that that would have been that the been shocker. Great. That would have been Do the great. Do it the Tarantino way. Yeah, and just taken... Rewrite history. Fucking taken out Bruce Wayne along with his family. Just to go to show you how just desolate and terrible this version of this world and the multiverse is. It's true. This is a different version. This technically now is a Elseworlds story. Yeah, it 100% is. So why couldn't Bruce have been murdered too? The, every interaction that we see bruce wayne in in this movie is so deeply uncomfortable like get your hands out of that kid's mouth jesus christ but yeah you're right we don't we don't need to see bruce and martha or no thomas and martha wayne get murdered again and i believe i it was kevin smith talking on martha (laughs) i remember kevin smith talking on a fat man beyond where he was like they should have killed bruce wayne that would have been the bleaker but better ending I was going to bring this up at the end of the movie, but since we're talking about it now, uh, at the end of the film, the Joker, is, or Arthur, the Joker, is in a police car that gets attacked, ambushed by a stolen ambulance so that all of his followers can, like, get him out of the car. You know, basically free him. Sure, they, yeah, right? it's a prison break. Right? And when they yeah. take him out of the car in a weirdly, annoyingly Christ-like manner, which, Jesus Christ, Todd Phillips on the nose... They Kinda take like... him out of the car, they put him on the hood, and the second it show, it's cuts into a scene of Bruce sitting in between his dead parents, devastated, thus the beginning of Batman, and in the next scene, you see an unconscious Joker wake up. So literally in this film, the birth of Batman is the birth of the Joker. It happens in the same moment, which I liked That's and neat. hated. That's at least a little different. And... Yeah, it's a clever idea, but fuck, why did we need it? 
But and also, also bringing up the fact that, like, say it's another twenty years until Bruce Wayne becomes Batman, Arthur is easily right. what in He's his, his mid thirties. No, well, I mean, Joaquin Phoenix at the time was forty five when he shot the Joker. So yeah, another so ten years, Bruce Bruce will be in his twenties easily. Well, in ten years, he'll be in his twenties and yeah. prime Batman. Batman started okay. around him in his early twenties. So 20s. 10, 15 years, yeah. Yeah, he's going to be in his fifties, late fifties, sixties. Yeah. So he's going to be what more of the the mobile? geriatric geriatric the Joker. Joker. <laughs> yeah, he's not going to be versus I mean, young prime Batman, especially with the smoking habit and the uh, you know the eating disorder that he has. Like that guy is not going to live into his sixties. To be a decent a Joker. Lot. I'm sorry. Like, you've got to think about some real world aspects with some of these things. The guy is a habitual smoker. He clearly has an eating disorder. He does not eat. You never see him eat on film once. And he's so skinny. Oh, my God. Walking Phoenix body was so Oh, gross. man. The very, first, the very first time I saw you squirm was Ugh. the very first time you see Ugh. Arthur dance topless Ugh. with his hands up in the air. Just, oh, I hated and you just it. see those ribs popping oh, out. I hated and it you got so, so much. <laughs> you got so squirmy. This movie was visceral for me. It. I was so deeply uncomfortable watching this film. That there were times I was wearing my Barbie hoodie, by the way, my fluffy, warm, bright pink Barbie hoodie. The amount of times I pulled that hoodie over my face and like pulled the drawstrings tight was more than I would like to say. And caveman kept having to be like, nope, you got to watch the film. And I kept going, nope, I don't want to. Stop hiding behind your hoodie. This film just made me so deeply uncomfortable. It was honestly a like a two hour panic attack. It was visceral. My skin was crawling. Like, ugh, I did not like it. Part of the reason why this movie was a solid two-hour panic attack is that the music is so intense the entire time. The score does not relent in the emotions of this movie, and I felt it in my cells. I really enjoyed this score for the most part. There was a lot of drum banging. Yeah. That was just very repetitive throughout the entire movie, which might be... I didn't notice that so much because I just felt like that was a oh, part was of, like, like that dum, visceral sort of... Dum, like... Dum, and I just kept going. And there were certain parts of the score that did something different than that. Yeah. And those parts were good, but they were short. See, for me, the, the drum... I didn't even, like, clock the drumming. I just felt like it was a, a heartbeat or... You know, just this this base of anxiety. I mean, you've you've had a panic attack before. You know what it's like to have your heart pounding so loudly you can hear it. And that's what, to me, those moments felt like. The music might have been what was giving you the panic attack. Oh, 100%. If the music had been any different. In fact, there are moments later on in the movie where the mov music is different. And it ripped me so violently out of the film, I didn't know what to do with myself. So the composer, Hildur Guttendutter won a Academy Award for the score. And well-deserved, because it, it is a fantastic score. Now, I remember at the time, because I watched this Academy Awards, and I don't remember a lot about it, but I do remember Joker winning, because at the time I was very anti, like, even more anti. I'd have to say first that after watching this movie with you mm -hmm. and having a second view of it and kind of knowing where it was going, I did come to appreciate it a little more I, it's still not like something i really like but i did like it more when i was watching these academy awards i remember really wanting 1917 to win best score mm -hmm. of all the scores that were nominated that year it was to me it was 1917 and the joker were like the two big ones that were head to head um, yeah, like, uh, I'm looking at the nominees right now. John Williams wasn't going to get it for The Rise of Skywalker because nothing, The Rise of Skywalker was never going to win an Oscar. It's just like he uh, didn't get one for Indiana Jones this which, last uh, that is so stupid that they nominated him, but, like, that's neither here nor there. Um, Alexander Desplat for Little Women and then Randy Newman for Marriage Story. I actually kind of think that it's great that this Icelandic woman who has never really done a lot of, like she scored chernobyl but she hasn't done a lot of other scores which i do like the score for chernobyl but a lot the fact that she More won this one. over these big names is pretty cool um i don't remember much about the music of 1917 i don't remember much about 1917 except again it was a two and a half hour panic attack 
Um, I wish that one was on this list. I love that movie so much. Oh, I don't. I could happily never watch that movie again. And, and I be would pretty gladly content. just sit down right now after this podcast and just start watching. Well, it. you do that. I'm going to go get us lunch. Great. Um, but, but I think that the music for me it was such a visceral part of this film, um, and it 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 lent it lent to a lot of the emotions because later in the movie there. It, it did, but then it got constantly interrupted by pointless needle drops. Oh, the needle drops. So some of the needle drops made sense. These, like, creepy... The use of songs from the 50s um, and 60s, those, like, sort of, you know, banal pop hits that are used in movies to be considered creepy or, like, you know, full of malice. Um, the way that most trailers these days use, like... a children's choir version of an 80s song to make it feel creepy um sure. I, I didn't mind that i didn't mind the use of like uh frank sinatra and other sort of like oh, 50s 60s pop artists um to i didn't i didn't mind the use of them in this film because i think that it added to the creepiness the part that i just it ripped me out of the movie at a point where it shouldn't have was the use of the song Rock and Roll Part 2. <laughs> by Gary Glitter. By Gary Glitter, who is, you know, a convicted uh, sex offender. So that's great. Um, but the use of that song when the Joker is descending the stairs. Another man descending and, stairs yeah, this, to, yeah, yeah, to plummet fucking, to his rock bottom. Yeah, this this movie is all about ascension and of descension. It's the but main plot. The use of that song was so upsetting because it just, it didn't fit. That it didn't scene. fit the movie at all that scene or the scene a hundred times in different montages and fucking trailers and just it anything plays about during the sports now like it's yeah, a sport like that has always been the song that you hear playing at your yeah like it's it's totally a sports song so having it there was weird and then having a white room by Cream playing over the riot scene was also just really jarring and strange. I didn't agree with a lot of they the... They take you out of the movie. Like, there are some needle drops in movies that are earned. Yeah. These needle drops took me out because it didn't fit with what... It didn't fit with the score. The score no, it didn't fit the music at all that like, was the rest of the After you hear Rock and Roll Part 2 as he's coming down the stairs, then it just weirdly and uncomfortably transitions into the score yeah and, and it the score been the was score so the much better yeah, the score was if so this, much if, better if i'm sure whatever this music was before we got to that point yeah probably would have just worked just fine it would have been creepier instead it was just like i'm sure she wrote something choice. for the scene yeah. and then they just covered it with and eh, put some gary glitter in there oh did you know that have you ever heard rock and roll part two um or, i'm sorry this is part two have you ever heard part one no it's it's the same song but with lyrics. Did you know there are lyrics to that song? Oh, God. <laughs> I swear to God. I saw it. I, I saw it, so I played it, and I was like, "Oh, wow!" I never need to listen to it. Please don't ever play it for me. Bam, bam. Um, hey, it's. The, the song choice, especially towards the end of this movie, it was really rough because I thought that the score was incredible. It wasn't beautiful and take me away and I could listen to it falling asleep like the way that The Lord of the Rings is. It, I felt like the score added to the intensity of this film and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Can we talk about Zazzy Beats for a second? Oh yeah, we haven't, we haven't mentioned, mentioned her, her at, at all. all and she's at the beginning of the film. She's in a pretty big chunk of this film and what i knew to be instantly i knew to be fantasies like the second arthur meets her and starts to fantasize about her was so uncomfortable for well me. and because todd phillips has already set up when he starts fantasizing about being with robert de niro's character there's the the movie already kind of has like this sweeping well-lit um, yeah, it does change. The environment changes, yeah. and you're like, oh, he's dreaming. And that kind of happened with Zazie Beat's character as well. And so then you don't know what's imaginary and what's not. And so then by the time you get to the towards the end of the movie where you're being, it's being revealed that she wasn't there at all, it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I kind of figured. Was oh, this supposed to be a surprise? Buddy? Yeah, I knew. I knew from the second, like, when he was stalking her for an entire day. 
And then she knocks on his door and calls him out for it, but, like, is excited about it? I knew immediately that that was fake because, first of all, she used his name and he never introduced himself to her. And secondly, there's no woman that would see that fucking creep stalking her for a full day and be like, oh, I kind of liked it. Like, I'm, that was such a gross male fantasy. I think the first clue I had that she was not there was after his stand-up after his really bad stand-up that later gets put on murray's show Mm -hmm. her face is just like oh this is kind of embarrassing and then the very next scene they're just randomly out in the street in public just like having fun together like they're on a date yeah like as if what just happened on stage was fine was you know was oh you did a great job and it didn't it never seemed like she was just hanging out with him to be nice yeah the well, fantasies when she's like, what we see is fantasies later she's just so like oh this is so much fun i love hanging out with this guy yeah it's a very much like, a no, manic pixie this at dream all. girl it when she's in the hospital after his mom has a stroke like all of that it, those those fantasy scenes the fantasy scene with murray was so deeply uncomfortable and like we've all had we've all driven home and wondered what it was like you know to win an academy award we've all have our own little weird fantasy lives mine may or may not involve bucky barnes but like it's fine it's healthy it's it's totally normal but seeing somebody else's fantasies made me just cringe so hard when like he gets called out by murray in the audience and then he stands up and then he goes up to the front of the show and then they have that whole conversation like that felt so deeply uncomfortable and weirdly sexual like i seeing somebody else's fantasies like that like play large just made my whole body want to crawl into a dank hole and disappear which was another thing that kind of added to this the constant panic attack of this whole film if you were sick in a children's hospital and a clown came in to perform a show oh my god don't you think you'd rather just be put out of your misery oh my god just shoot me now just like those kids were sick enough they were already suffering i'm ready to go like oh my god especially that clown performance if you're happy and you know uh, (laughs) yeah and then all the kids with cancer just like oh just let me die like I, it was very uncomfortable. So uncomfortable. And then it was made even more uncomfortable because he drops his gun. Yeah, which kind of leads to him getting fired, which leads to him in the subway in his clown costume, watching some poor woman get harassed by three, you know, Wayne industry douchebags, just absolute dickholes. Three industry, three Wayne industry douchebags who still have great taste in music because he knows all the words to "Send in the Clowns" from Frank Sinatra, which. I don't know how many guys in their 20s or 30s. Maybe I'm just not a Frank Sinatra fan. I do not. Well, it was a different era. I mean, they grew up with, like, sure. Sinatra in their lives, whereas we didn't. I know every I know line to 80s, every... know it was the 80s, but come on. Well, I know every line to every uh, song on Hotel California because that's what I grew up with. You know, maybe their parents were... I don't know. I'm not trying to justify it. Uh, it just, just seemed like a weird thing to like to. It was a little to, too to show, on the nose to show your um your your dominance over another mm-hmm. person, being like oh, sing a little yeah, song about the... him. Yeah, it was a little too on the big red rubber nose, Todd Phillips. Uh, but then that guy got shot. So, well, speaking of the shooting, so we tried to do the math last night, and then I did realize your your original number of eight shots mm-hmm. was correct. Yeah. So he shoots. There are three guys on the train. He mm-hmm. shoots one of them dead with a single shot. Yeah. He shoots another one dead with two shots. Yep. And then shoots the third guy in the leg. Uh-huh. That guy That's then... four shots. Right. Then he runs away. Uh-huh. And he's, they're chasing him down the uh, the subway up the platform, stairs. Yeah. yeah. The platform to go to the stairs. Before he gets to the stairs, he shoots him again, which stop, stops him at the stairs. Yeah. He runs up to him, gets point blank range, mm-hmm. and just shoots him three more times uh in the back yeah it's it's a six That's shooter eight shots yeah. from a six shot gun and why so, the, i mean that always takes me out of films well but just it really like we bothered me in just this one. just like my pet peeve with drinks in cups like coffee i have another pet peeve which is where handguns or shotguns or other weapons are just operated incorrectly yeah whether it's eight shots coming out of a six shot revolver or with shotguns uh, when they're using like a pump mm-hmm. uh, pump action shotgun and they just keep cocking it 
pumping it. And it's yeah, like, where are those bullets yeah, th- coming those from? rounds should be just flying out at the side of your gun. Yeah. But <laughs> they, I, yeah, and then you got sound effects in movies where everybody's got pistols, mm-hmm. but all you hear is the pump action sound <laughs> effects. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. and it's just like they're just holding pistols. Those are some of my silly pet peeves when it comes to movies. So that bothers me the way that in superhero movies, like especially Avengers movies, they're really guilty of this. You never see them put in any sort of like earpiece. They just automatically are connected. Yeah, to they're just all. They're they meet talking somebody to down the street. Other. They meet somebody down the street, and then they split up, and they automatically talk to. Yeah, that like they can somehow still talk to each other, even though they're blocks away, and one's on a fucking building, and the other one's ground level. They're having a full conversation, but you never see them use like any sort of earpiece or anything. And even if they did, how is that earpiece picking up well, the conversation and they don't that even, well? They don't even show their ear either. No. They always have to put their hand up to their ear. Yeah, like they there. cover it. That, look, little, <laughs> Just we silly, all have our little silly uh, little. Peeves. But then it led to uh, Arthur in a bathroom having just murdered three guys and dancing. The physicality... He really that, does love dancing. The physicality of this role, honestly, didn't endure Joaquin Phoenix to me because I still do not like him as a person or an actor. He really leaned into the physicality of this role. The fact that he lost like over 50 pounds to be this character. The fact that he's dancing in this weird, twisted way. It really shows just the kind of the insanity in his head it creeped me out so hard and i i have to give it up to him i can't imagine anybody else playing this version of this role there's a part where there's a comedian on stage right before arthur goes up the comedian is making jokes about comparing a girlfriend to buying a car and the, essentially they're just a bunch of outdated jokes this is kind of how Todd Phillips made his career. And he, outdated sexist jokes. Yes. He he made, uh, he directed Road Trip. Mm-hmm. Uh, Which I haven't seen. Oh, jeez. But yeah, it's Very... a gross out teen comedy from the early 2000s. And you got Old School. Which is a gross out teen comedy from the early 2000s. Scar- uh, Starsky and Hutch, which, which is actually probably my favorite movie from todd phillips i the last time i vividly remember watching that film is on an airplane coming back from switzerland the amount of the amount of times at work that i just go do it do it do it okay so there's your favorite guy yeah um he did the hangover trilogy of course which i think were the the first one was fun the the first first one was fun but then they got worse and worse diminishing returns and then i feel like because they got worse and worse he was like well you're obviously not into my comedy anymore yeah but i don't think it wasn't that we were getting tired of comedy we were getting tired of his shitty comedy well i think that we were growing as a person you know growing as a society in terms of moving away from gross out teen boy boobies racist jokes you know shocking humor and growing more you know we were getting away from that stuff because that was very prevalent in the early 2000s with your dane cook with you know american pie with all these films that were like gross out and teen boy and blah 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 like i think society is in general like when millennials started to grow up and grow away from that i think that hollywood had a hard time with that because what is it gen z is underneath us they weren't going for it i mean Todd Phillips even said himself that he decided to make this like really dark drama film, because yeah. if he couldn't make the comedies he wanted to make anymore, then this is what he was going to do. There was a moment in the movie mm-hmm. when Arthur's on the couch next to Murray. Arthur says that comedy is subjective. Mm-hmm. And actually, the line is... Comedy is subjective, Murray. Isn't that what they say? All of you, the system that knows so much, you decide what's right or wrong the same way that you decide what's funny or not do you think that was i felt like it was like a like talking like the director was talking to the audience yeah comedy is subjective like no it is we all have okay we've all laughed at terrible jokes that we shouldn't laugh at i bought road trip on dvd yeah dane cook was a huge thing for a while there you know but to say that there's no more comedy that he can make carrot top is still somehow working the way though that he's like i can't make any more comedies because you don't like my humor yeah all right get over yourself a little bit yeah the amount of speaking of getting over yourself todd phillips like (laughs) 
I don't know if it was his choice as the director or if it was a director of photography's choice, but the amount of slow motion zoom ins where the, the, the camera's locked in place and just zooming in very slowly towards one direction happened over and over and over. And you know, over. I don't think I clocked that. Like, use some more. You, I need some variety sometimes. <laughs> I enjoy artsy films. Yeah. And he was really trying to. It's kind of like. I mean, Bradley Cooper was a producer on this mm -hmm. movie, but talk about really overdoing it with a movie like Maestro. Bradley Cooper, will you ever get your Oscar? The thing that bothered me the most in this film. I do want to hear the thing about that bothered you the most in this film. Maybe not the most, but maybe, well, maybe the most. I don't know. I haven't decided yet because I need to talk to uh, you about it. After we watched this movie last night, lovely listeners, uh, we did not talk to each other about it. We saved it for the show. And it was really hard not to just turn to him and go, what the fuck are they trying to do making the Joker Thomas Wayne's son? I don't need oh the God. Joker being Batman's half-brother. I, that, oh, that okay, plot so point made me so angry. I'm, I'm so angry about that. Because even though they, de they deny it in the film, it is played as if it is real. So in that universe, the Joker is Batman's half-brother. It is I played as it. if it's real. It, it is. It. It's You're telling me that a wealthy white man oh, was definitely a cover up. couldn't have covered it up? It was for sure covered up. It was up. for sure covered up. I remember when I watched this movie in the theater, and he goes to Arkham State Hospital, which, mm -hmm. and we get to meet Brian Tyree Henry. Who is perfect I'm always in happy everything. when I see yeah, him on screen. I'm I wish he was in this movie more, but that anything. wasn't his character. I remember when I saw this movie in the theater, and we get to the scene where he opens up the, his mom's letter, mm -hmm. and he, he starts reading it and finds out she admits to Thomas Wayne in the letter that her and her son are yeah. need some help. Yeah. Can you please help us, Thomas Wayne? Help your son. Yeah, Thomas help Wayne. your son. I remember sitting in the theater, seeing that ha unfold before me, and just thinking, no, please, no, don't make them half brothers. Please do don't, not. Don't do it. Don't, don't do it. it. It's too much. Like, it's one thing to give the Joker a backstory. Sure. You which wanna... we already don't want don't need but then you have to keep rewriting history by making them half brothers yeah you just it have doesn't to, make... you have to shove in more bad why more. Yeah. just right down your fucking throat. just stick with your main he like steals into this fancy party or this fancy screening of a charlie chaplin film to confront thomas wayne in a bathroom which i know it's the early 80s but where is any security surrounding a billionaire they just let anybody walk into uh, sure, he had on, like, a jacket from the movie theater, but, like, that that fools no one. And everybody in that theater is so well-dressed. And even yeah. if you do have a bellhop, he eventually he's takes so the... He's so shabby. He throws the bellhop suit away, and he then he's just back in his own... He literally past security guards, and you think that somebody would have been like, hey, you're not supposed to be here. But then we wouldn't have gotten the scene where he's confronted in the bathroom by Arthur and denies the fact that he's his father, even though they have the same fucking nose. Like they look very <laughs> similar. I mean, Joaquin, he, uh, Arthur even says, like, obviously look we yeah. look alike from, from the second he starts, uh, Thomas Wayne starts being like, your mom's crazy and she adopted you and she abused you. And I, of course I'm not your son. How could I, or, or I'm of course I'm not your father. How could I be your father? You're his dad. Like this movie, as much as it tries to deny it, it clearly, Thomas Wayne is Arthur Fleck's father, and I hate that. I hate it so much. Which then made the scene where um, Arthur goes and visits a young Bruce Wayne, who, by the way, no billionaire child at any point in history would be allowed that close to a gate. Where the fuck was Alfred, even if he was a terrible Alfred? You know, it, so that, that scene where he's got his hands all up in his half-brother's face and mouth, like, just... Like, are you telling oh, me in the next it. ten years, Batman's going to be so much smarter that he doesn't just... Like, there is a guy on the other side of your wall who didn't have a clown nose on at one point, then ducks behind the wall, comes back up the clown nose, and starts dancing to your gate, and you're going to let him not only put his hands on you, but, but in your mouth. In your mouth. He just stands there. Like, Bruce. What was, the... was a 10-year-old in the 80s really that how stupid? Smooth brain does, how much of a smooth brain does Bruce have? Well, I mean, world's greatest detective? World's greatest detective in not 10 yet. years? He's just, yeah. <laughs> 
year one's still a long ways away, and then he still has... Ugh. He gets smarter eventually. And then Arthur starts strangling Alfred, who kind of does nothing, and Bruce does nothing, and it's just... I mean, let's be honest. I guess at 10 years old, Bruce Wayne has had a pretty lofty life. He has yet to lose his parents highly educated. in a scattle it's, of pearls, so he's... It's not like his parents die, and then he gets to go to college. No, but his parents die, and then he sees he's the horror the of the real world. going to the best private schools in the country, probably. Yeah, yeah, but he's been sheltered. I don't know. I just... I, I hate that whole... Still, don't let some stranger put his fingers yeah, like, in your mouth. I don't think any of our lovely listeners out there, any of the minglers, would just let a stranger, Joaquin Phoenix or not, put their fingers in their mouth. Even though the whole time I knew I was watching Joaquin Phoenix, he still embodied the role very well. I Okay, so let's get into it. Remember back when Joaquin Phoenix was filming that weird mockumentary with Casey Affleck, who was also gross? Um, Which is the only thing I can think of when he's on the couch with Murray. Yeah. I'm just thinking about when he was on the couch the last with time, David Letterman. The last time I was that uncomfortable watching Joaquin Phoenix on a late night talk show couch was when he was just pulling some shit on Letterman. And I'm sorry, you don't pull shit on Letterman. You don't. You don't. And I, the second, and I, that was in an era, by the way, that I watched Letterman like nightly. I recorded it and watched it the next day. I fucking loved Letterman in that era. And so watching Joaquin Phoenix come out of nowhere and just be like a dick to him really made me dislike the actor. And I have disliked the actor and pretty much have avoided everything he's done since then. I get it, let it go, blah, blah, blah. But at a certain point, pre I'm still here, Joaquin Phoenix was a great actor. He was in Signs and I adored him in Signs. He was in The Village, which is the one, The Village is the one M. Night Shyamalan movie that I'm an apologist for. We could go into a whole, we, there's a whole podcast and how that movie could have been re-edited with one scene. It's all scene. about the editing. And made it a better film. Better I film with the editing. love The Village. I think it's a great film. And I think that Joaquin Phoenix was wonderful in The Village. I enjoyed him as an actor up until I'm Still Here and his weird derailing of his own career for shits and giggles. And ever since then, I have not enjoyed a single thing that he's been in. I'm not going to see Napoleon ever. You know, uh, Napoleon wasn't good though. Yeah, like I'm. There are a ton of Joaquin Phoenix movies. We have to watch her, and I'm not excited about it. I think you'll like her. He was really good in this movie. He really embodied the role. He did a great job. I didn't need it, but I really saw. I, I saw why he got his Oscar. I think his Oscar was well deserved. Is where I'm going with this one. Yeah, Even I guess I don't like him. I guess when I when I say I didn't like him, like I understand he is a good actor and he did deserve he did the a Oscar great job for this role. film. Maybe maybe I was just so hating on the movie yeah. that I just hated everything around it, including him like winning the Oscar. Especially if you look at the other nominees this year or that year, I really think that the only other person that might have gotten it would have been Leonardo DiCaprio for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, because mm. he was. He was the only best option. I mean, I didn't see, I didn't see Marriage Story because I didn't want to cry at Adam Driver's uh, marriage falling apart, which is the exact same reason why I haven't watched that Jessica Chastain Oscar Isaac show where their marriage falls apart. Um, I didn't see the Two Popes. I didn't see Pain and Glory, like with Antonio Banderas, but Leonardo DiCaprio was incredible in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh yeah. But Joaquin Phoenix was. It was the better role. It's in funny because I think Brad Pitt ended up winning Best Supporting Actor. Yeah, that year, which was more deserved, in all honesty. When he murders his former clown coworker and has all that blood splatter all over his white face, newly painted on white face. Yeah. Not only was that just such a stunning image, it was such a beautiful image. I remember sitting there thinking, like, oh, my God, the way that the blood was splattered across him and his white face. But then that whole bit with trying to open the door for his uh, the other colleague who was a little person who couldn't reach right. the door lock and had to have Arthur stand up and He's get like, it. Arthur, I need help. <laughs> like that. I was so worried that he was going to kill that guy yeah. in that moment. The whole time you're just like, get out of there. Like, run. Yeah. The, the, I mean, this this guy... This guy just watches his friend and coworker get murdered by their former coworker, probably shitting himself, thinking that he's about to die soon. Arthur says, "You can go. You've always been nice to me, so I'm not going to hurt you." And then he walks up to the front door, and it's locked, and he can't unlock it because he's too short. The fear that guy must have been in. 
And I really genuinely thought that Arthur was going to kill him in that moment, too. But instead, he lets I him go too. because he was the only one that was nice to him yeah. at their You're job. You're the only one who was ever nice to me, so he lets him go. That that part was, again, the, I'm using the word visceral, but like this whole movie and that part especially just had this visceral reaction to it. Which then led into, you know, the dissension down the stairs with Gary Glitter. <sighs> <sighs> And uh, the train scene where the cops get just fucking beat the shit out of on the train, which was terrifying and claustrophobic and very, very strange. Watching watching the, that, that whole sequence of the cops on the train for me, I was just so... I mean, it's already uncomfortable, but it just added to it so much. The Murray Franklin show knew who Arthur Fleck was. Like, they knew that that was him coming on the show. Like, it's not like he just shows up as the Joker and they don't know that that's also Arthur Fleck, which again goes back to the whole, the Joker shouldn't have a name. He's just the Joker. So the fact that like, there is a connection, there's a literal paper trail between these two. That's the problem with having a past is that they know, they know where you live. They know who your loved ones are. When the casting director for the Murray Franklin show calls up Arthur, she uses his name, Arthur Fleck. Right. He is, even though uh, Murray introduces him as Joker, because that's what he had called him at one point, they still know that that's Arthur Fleck. So like they know who the Joker is. The Joker is Arthur Fleck. And again, the Joker should be an anonymous agent of chaos and not Arthur Fleck. But he goes on to the show, you know, he has his weird entrance, he kisses the Dr. Ruth woman, which was so uncomfortable. Not just, not, not just the regular kiss like a celebrity would do when they come on a talk show. No, like it's, it's like a full, full on, on mouth kiss like, and you for can like see how 10 seconds. uncomfortable she is by that. And the audience is just laughing. Like, yeah. Oh, isn't that funny? Like, he yeah, kissed her. So cute? Oh. And they have this whole conversation, which is punctuated by the trombone player knock knock who's there it's the police ma'am your son's been hit by a drunk driver he's dead (laughs) oh no 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 you cannot joke about that the trombone player choosing that moment to let out a womp 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 or whatever it was was so funny but so unnecessary and just like, you know that guy regretted it when 10 seconds later his boss's brains are splattered <laughs> on the wall behind him. What a choice to have that trombone player. That's kind of all I could think about that whole scene. I knew that he was going to murder Murray Franklin. Like, I knew that that was going to happen. But seeing it happen was still just so... He was ugh. shot. When you see him get shot is a very Scorsese way to get shot. Yeah. The man has a way to shoot people like when you watch movies like casino or goodfellas or even um i didn't expect to see it in um killers of the flower moon but he even there are people who get shot in that and it's done in that same very scorsese kind of way a swift violent right brutal everything's very jerky and violent mm-hmm. and yeah it's very specific that you don't see a lot of directors shoot <laughs> no pun intended people that way but when I saw Murray get killed, it reminded me of Scorsese. And then, I mean, we've already kind of talked about the ending of this film, but just going back to it really quickly, watching Arthur's true descent into the Joker when he becomes the Joker, uh, you know, it's it's a sickening thing. And Joaquin Phoenix did a great job with it, as much as I hate to admit that. He did a really good job. At the very end, he's seen, he's in Arkham. After all, said and done, after he smeared blood onto his face to turn it into a smile and stood there amongst all of his adoring fans in a huge riot, which just goes to show how destructive an angry mob the can riot, be. The yeah. riot that leads to Thomas the death and Martha of Wayne to die. The Waynes, yeah. yeah. But at the very end of the film, he's in Arkham. He's talking to a psychologist who it it looks, she looks kind of modern. It was hard to tell whether or not that scene was set in a modern era, like post Batman. It wasn't the same actress. It wasn't the same actress. I don't think it was. He has a little joke that he won't tell her. And then he sings a little song, which I was very disturbed by. And then as he's seen walking away from the interview, 
he's walking away with bloody feet? Yeah, his shoes have blood on the Is that to of... infer that he hurt the psychologist? I think he killed her. And then uh, casually walked out of the room and then ran down the hallway one way and then down the other. I didn't enjoy that ambiguity. I, I couldn't tell if that was like, if it was real or if that was just because that's who the Joker is. It's hard to tell what is real Yeah, this whole this movie. movie is... This all could have been just inside of this man's head that we see at the very, very is end. Is there an end credit sequence? This movie was great. I enjoyed it. I will never watch it again. At the very least, I can say that I've finally seen it. I have opinions about it, both good and bad. It is a movie that I enjoyed, but also hated. I, I don't ever want to watch The Joker again. In fact, I had a friend last night, shout out Megan, who basically said that she'll never watch it, but she'll happily live through my commentary. So this one's for you, my love. I don't think this movie is necessary viewing the way that I feel like Barbie is necessary viewing. And I guess everybody else feels about Spirited Away is necessary viewing. I mean, I'd watch parasite a dozen more times before i see this oh one i'd happily watch parasite again before watching this again do you think so okay the joker came out it was a phenomenon people talked about it endlessly incels love it you know uh men's rights activists all over this fucking film oh you know it won oscars joaquin phoenix won an oscar all of this all of this incredible stuff happened around this movie right now they're making a sequel a musical, too. Is this sequel necessary? And is the answer no? Of See, and that's not. another reason why I think Todd Phillips is, can be up his butt sometimes with this stuff. What's the name of the sequel? Joker of Folia Dua. Folia Dua. Folia Dua. That right there. Yeah. I'm already rolling my eyes. A madness. That is an old phrase that means a madness shared by two. That is a. I'm still rolling my it eyes. It is a French phrase. I know this from an X-Files episode. It is a French phrase that means a madness shared by two. No, and I get it. And it's all about Harley Joker Quinn is supposed to be Quinn. in this one. Yeah. Played by Lady Gaga, which again, I'm rolling my eyes. Yeah, I am too. I adore Especially Lady Gaga as a Gucci. singer. I don't need her as an actress. Sorry, but I don't. After she went absolutely nuts over the House of Gucci and talked about it endlessly, that elicited a lot of eye rolling for me because i adore lady gaga she's a great musician i mean i'll watch it i'm gonna Ugh. i may not watch in the theater are you nah, i don't know it depends if i have a friend that wants to go see it with me i don't want to see it by myself how's that and i know you're not going to watch it with me and the fact no absolutely not and the fact that it's a musical like what what i'm very so can joaquin phoenix sing i guess he all, did it, try to be a rapper it has once. all it has all piqued my curiosity but i just don't know I is it necessary? Know. It's not necessary. Probably not. Like, Was this one necessary? Well, no. But does it need a sequel? Are they just trying to make more money? Of course. This one made a lot of money. God, I'm going through the uh, IMDb photos and it's showing a lot of like photography or uh, paparazzi set photos. And it seems like it's still set in the 80s. He's still got the weird makeup. He's still got the weird suit. You know, it's, it's a whole lot. But like the footage or the pictures that have been released by... Todd Phillips of Lady Gaga of Harley Quinn and the Joker it just I don't like it I don't like it I also don't necessarily like or appreciate the backstory that Harley Quinn has where she was an educated woman who, who was abused by the Joker who was ridiculed and hurt and constantly just fucked over by the Joker Harley Quinn deserves her own agency which is what she gets in the animated show on HBO Max which is perfect it's so, so good. I don't need this story told again on the big screen. And maybe that's just it. Maybe I'm tired of these stories being told. You know, how much of the Joker can we handle? Uh, they, the Joker was a deleted scene in The Batman, played by Barry Keoghan, which was really good. I thoroughly enjoyed that deleted scene. I enjoyed the deleted it scene, but, but I, I didn't need it. it. I'm glad they deleted the scene. Yes, absolutely. And I hope that the Batman part two doesn't actually have the Joker in it. I hope that that was a deleted scene. They pushed it to the side and that's all we're ever going to see of it. Doesn't that make you just kind of hate it? Seeing them together. Yeah. I, I just showed K-Man a picture of uh, Harley and Arthur from the Joker two. And it like, I just kind of hate it. I hate how she looks, even though it's very st stereotypical, the dark black makeup, the red lips, the cigarette. Like, I just... 
I mean, one reason don't need it. One reason they are making a sequel, like we said, because it made a million dollars. A million? Billion. It made a billion. <laughs> yeah, uh, between worldwide sales and the home market performance on DVD and others, uh, yeah, it's made over one point one billion dollars. Which uh, good for that. Okay, so they want to make more money. I just, I, I don't care. I don't care. I love Batman. I will happily watch every Batman movie that ever comes out, whether or not it is good. When we get to the Batman, I am passionate about how much I enjoy that film, and I think that Robert Pattinson makes a great Batman. I enjoyed Batfleck. I thought he was a really good Batman. I don't... I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to the Batman that we're getting from Matthew Vaughn in two years. Yeah, which oh, I mean, I'm sad that it's still so far away, but like I get it. And I'm looking forward to whatever Batman stories that James Gunn is planning on making. Which will be interesting, and I trust James Gunn. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, I don't need backstories anymore. Just, you know, what was done with the Riddler in the Batman was fresh and new and intriguing, and I liked it. I don't need to see another Marvel Origins unless it's a a character we've never seen before. I don't want to know the X-Men Origins when they hit the big screen. I don't need a Joker Origins movie. I don't. I don't need another Harley Quinn origins film because it's been done time and time again. And it just makes me feel bad for Harley, especially with the Harley Quinn animated series being so funny and clever and biting. And with birds of prey, which was honestly such an underrated DC. Very underrated. It's my second favorite to wonder woman and wonder woman's only my favorite because of the sentimental value I have over it. Birds of prey is a better film. Give us more fresh takes on these characters instead of just the same old shit caveman what do you rate the joker one to five one to five clown tears when i first watched this movie i would have given it probably a two Mm -hmm. now i think i'm more like a three and a half yeah it's still missing some stars but my like i said my biggest gripe is the batman joker of it all it wasn't necessary you take all that stuff out it's mostly still the same movie uh but probably better because now i'm not angrily watching it now i'm (laughs) probably more invested in it as a story about a man who falls on bad times and shit luck and uh, well i mean he was mental illness and decides to take it out on the world that's taking it out on him yeah and i i too would give it three and a half stars it's not my favorite film that I've watched so far. In fact, I've been trying to think where I'm going to place it in the letterbox lineup because I enjoyed it more than watching Fight Club again, which is shocking for me. That is shocking. I would watch Parasite before I watch this movie ever again. Not that you're going to watch Parasite. Not that I'm going to watch Parasite, but I would before watching the Joker, but I would still rate this a little bit higher than Parasite just because if nothing else, the artistry that went into this film was incredible. The set design, the music is terrifying as it was the acting on everybody's accounts yeah joaquin phoenix was great but so was the woman who played his mom so was thomas wayne so was the the people that he interacted with on a daily basis it felt like such a real film i mean zazzy beats was so good in this movie both playing the love interest and the creep interest it is a really wonderfully put together movie that i never want to watch again so yes i give it three and a half stars because I've got to appreciate the artistry, but it's missing some stars because I don't fucking need it and I will not go back to it. You know, should you watch this film? Maybe? I guess it depends on what mood you're in. You if, know? If you're a film buff, well, you probably already have. Yeah, but I'm a but film buff and I haven't. I know, but I'm. we kind of made you. Yeah, I had to. Ugh. Like, without the podcast, would you have ever? No. Absolutely not. But you wouldn't have either. You would have never been I would have like, never forced you, guess no. what, Maggie? We're going to watch The Joker tonight. I would have been like, are you a goddamn mind man? Like, no. No, we're not. We're going to watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine again and fall asleep early. Like, So, yeah, I, it's up to you whether or not you want to watch this film if you haven't seen it yet. It is a beautifully made film. It is an unnecessary film. And I don't think we'll be revisiting it for the sequel. And that's okay. <laughs> So, Maggie. Yes, caveman? I've got two questions for you. Can't wait. Maggie, would Oscar Isaac have made this movie better? Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. Yeah. His perfect, beautiful, handsome, perfect, beautiful face would have made this movie a thousand times better. 
And Maggie, which character would you have Oscar Isaac replace? I, that's a tough one, because I don't think I would want him to replace Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker, because I don't think anybody could have done that role but him. And the only other really beefy like role that he could have fit into would probably have been Thomas Wayne. So yes, I want to see Oscar Isaac as Thomas Wayne. I don't want to see him murdered or his wife's pearls spread across the ground in slow-mo fucking again. Yes, I, I think he would have been delightful and creepy and handsome and perfect and beautiful as Thomas Wayne. I would have liked that very much. It's time to do the news with me, Caveman. Today we're looking back on this last weekend's box office. And Ghostbusters Frozen Empire was just released last Friday. And it brought in $45 million. Which isn't bad, considering that that was Madame Webb's entire domestic gross. And she is currently sitting in, I think, the 20th, 20th place, yes. In second place, we have Dune Part 2 with $17 million this week. That's 38% down from last week, but they've also lost 410 theaters, with almost $600 million worldwide. Kung Fu Panda 4 is in the number 3 slot with another $16.5 million, bringing its worldwide gross to $267 million. Nothing can ever stop the panda, even when it's part four. Scroll down a little bit. In number five, we have Arthur the King, which is up to $14 million total, and a movie that I really want to see, Late Night with the Devil, starring David Desmalchen, I've heard great things about this movie. I really want to see it. I can't wait. And my baby, Love Lies Bleeding, still going strong. It's only been out for three weekends, and it has brought in a domestic share of five and a half million dollars. Still not bad for a A24 indie film. And those were the highlights from this last weekend. Now we're moving on to movie reviews. And this week, I had the absolute pleasure, nay... The, I can't do it. I can't do it, guys. I watched Jake Gyllenhaal's Roadhouse. was recently released on Amazon Prime. And for those of you who had the time to watch this movie, I'm sorry you wasted your time. If you actually enjoyed it, that's great. I feel, I'm, I'm jealous. I wasn't the biggest fan of the original Roadhouse from 1989. I just didn't grow up on it, but I have seen it. So I don't have the nostalgia for the film. However, beyond the cheesy 80s dialogue, hair, filmmaking, uh, general plot, there's not a lot that I really like about the original Roadhouse, except a few things. I think they got the aesthetic of a shitty bar, tavern, where bikers and other shitty people hang out, get drunk, and then just trash the place. But it's a shitty place to begin with. You know, the the, the set de- decorators, the stunt coordinators of the original of the original Roadhouse had something when it came to making it feel real. Like what was happening at this shitty bar is something that you would you could walk in on in real life and see really see how terrible this place was Patrick Swayze is charming probably the coolest I've ever seen Patrick Swayze with the exception of Point Break but for the most part his character is very his acting because of the character is very subdued calm not a lot not emoting a lot but I mean he uses facial movements and eye movements and I think he played the part really fun. So that's how I feel about the 1989 Roadhouse. Now, let's fast forward to 2024. Jake Gyllenhaal, Conor McGregor, some other actors. But before I even get into some of the acting, let's go back to what I was saying about the original Roadhouse. You've got the bar looks like it's a shitty Roadhouse bar. It sucks whereas 
the new one is, I guess, updated for 2024 and being in Florida, they looked like they were on location or at least at a location that passed as a white sands palm tree type beach. So this bar is has beachfront property. It looks amazing. Everything, it's a, it's a bar that anybody would love to go to. There's a few fights that happen occasionally by a couple people, but nothing compared to the original Roadhouse where one person breaks a bottle over another person's head and the entire bar disru- is disrupted and goes into an all fist fight bottle breaking over heads i'm sure some a lot of concussions and death whereas the new bar is clean everything looks modern and new but nobody's in this bar at night it's filled maybe half to capacity and live music is played every night so this woman who owns the bar has the money to afford beachfront property live bands every night and pay jake gyllenhaal's character I think she said somewhere between two and five thousand dollars a week, but nobody in her bar. It's an empty bar for most of the movie, with the occasional nighttime uh, rock, you know, the the live band in the background. There's people in the bar, but never to the capacity of the original, where and a full out bar brawl doesn't really, it never really happens. And I think some other weak points about this movie were its villains. The villains were nothing compared to the original. The way the the original villain, the rich, the millionaire who owned the town and had everybody in his pocket because he was so rich and powerful, he controlled this town. You don't get that sense at all from the new one. Yes, the the bad guy is rich, but he has he doesn't he doesn't care about the bar itself. The only thing he absolutely cares about, he wants to get rid of the bar to put up property like every modern villain just wants to own apartments on beachfront property i say modern but that's been happening since the first superman movie i don't think jake gyllenhaal was good in this movie at all the fight choreography was better than the original that's the one thing i give this film the there's there's a very uncomfortable jerkiness that happens sometimes that I really don't like. I think they were trying to be original or stylistic in the way that they filmed the fights. I didn't like that, but I liked the choreography. Much better than the pull back your fist and just punch towards a man's face, which is all they did in the original. This one, you actually get to see some fun mixed martial arts uh, since Jake Gyllenhaal's character is an MMA fighter and Conor McGregor is a real MMA fighter. They were able to make Jake Gyllenhaal's fighting look professional, especially when he slaps people, disarms people, uh, tells them how he's going to break them and disarm them and then does it. That's fun. But I didn't like his character. His Dalton was not as good as Patrick Swayze's Dalton. But then we get to Conor McGregor, who should just stay in the octagon, as they say. He's a terrible actor. He might be a good fighter, but he's a terrible, terrible actor. The way he just gorillas himself around the, the set, the, the way he walks, you know, oh, my muscles are so massive, I have to walk like I'm wearing a diaper. The way he delivers lines is so bad that it's distracting and takes me out of the movie. There are so many talented stuntmen that could do that role and act. I know, right? Stuntmen can act. They would have done much better than this knucklehead from UFC. In the end, the plot felt very disjointed. Lacked The whole movie lacked the charisma, coolness, and honestly, just I was, I was actually missing some of that 89 cheese. I'm sure there are people that would really that really would like this movie just for the action alone, but that's all this movie is offering in my opinion is action. And it was probably a good idea that this was not released in theaters. Surprisingly, this movie has a 61% from critics on Rotten Tomatoes. That really I can't I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. Uh 
However, audiences are agreeing with my feelings because the audience score on Rotten Tomatoes is 56%, which is funny because the original Roadhouse from 1989 got a 41% from critics, but a 67% from audiences. The worst thing that I could say about the 1989 Roadhouse is how misogynistic it is. Men are constantly trying to get women to dance topless, to have sex with them. They are constantly degraded, and all the female characters lack any kind of development or uh, anything really interesting. There's Swayze's love interest is played by a model turned actor, and that's about it from her. Whereas in Jake Gyllenhaal's Roadhouse, the only nudity I remember seeing is Conor McGregor's butt, and I really didn't want to see that. So those are my thoughts about Roadhouse. I hope everyone has a great week, and we'll see you next week on Movie Mingle. Well, Minglers, that was today's episode on The Joker. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it, because we sure did and didn't. Thanks for joining us. Again, please rate us across all platforms, however many stars. Please, five stars that you want to give us. Uh, you can follow us on Movie Mingle Pod on Instagram. Uh, Movie Mingle Pod on Letterbox as well, so you can keep along with how I, myself, rate the movies that we have seen. You can also email us at movieminglepod at gmail.com if you have any questions or comments or concerns or just want to say hey. And we really appreciate the time and the effort and the love that you've been giving us. It means the world to us. This is a silly little project that Caveman and I are working on, but we're having so much fun with it and with each other. Thanks for being a part of that. We hope you have a great day. Now, go mingle. Are you an effective team? We are an effective team. Let them fight. How did you just do that? I'm a really good lawyer. Here on Caladan, we have ruled by air power and sea power. On Arrakis, we need to cultivate desert power. Welcome, Mr. Beach. What's that bar? Uh, I'm a little confused. Oh, we wouldn't want that, would we? I don't want to brag, but I will. I was in the Avengers. The Avengers? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. What is that? I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. Toga, 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 toga.